We have an action-packed meeting tonight, so if we want to get out of here before the sun goes down, we better start now and promptly. The time is officially 6.06. .06. Um, thank you for that six-minute delay. Again, as we always do, we start our meetings prompt, and it's not just because we skid row and we handled our business, but the thing is, uh, we really are looking forward to this discussion. We've got a couple of uh, amazing presentations that our community is, you know, really, really excited about. Uh, you know, we've heard the buzz, we've heard all the hype, and now, you know, we actually get to see what's going on um, in terms of uh, what these newbies, if you will, <laughs> have, uh, are new to our community, uh, these entities are coming in to uh, see what they have for our community. And so we're very, very excited about uh, these presentations. So as you can see, they're setting up, they're ready to go. But first, you know, the Skid Row Labor Council Formation Committee, we have some housekeeping and some in-house business of our own. So if you're, uh, if you don't feel that you're a member, please bear with us. Uh, a couple of updates, uh, just I was a little bit tardy getting here and that's why we're late setting up. Um, we wanna talk about the King Edward Hotel, which is on the uh, North, West corner of Fifth and Los Angeles in Skid Row. And so um, last week, uh, last Tuesday, uh, the Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council's uh, Planning and Land Use Committee, they had their meeting. Uh, um, usually it's the third Wednesday, uh, third Tuesday of the month. And item, agenda item number 11B uh, was about uh, AT&T wanting to put antenna on, on the cell towers on top of the King Edward Hotel. And so, I, I planned on going to that meeting, but another meeting came up and I had to flip a coin and I did not go. So I reached out, I saw that the presenter was uh, Tanner Blackman, who works currently works for uh, Kendall Gagan, formerly uh, out of CD14, and he used to be a, uh, a co-board member with me when I was on uh, the Downtown San Jose Neighborhood Council in 2008 2014. So Tanner, I called Tanner and he called me back just moments ago and that's why I was late. Just to get an update, and so basically there's 16, uh, 16 individual antenna, uh, basically, uh, was it four in each direction, uh, north, south, east, and west, and I asked them if directly that they plan on extending that throughout in any other building in Skid Row, because that would be, is a major concern for us in terms of the potential toxicity. Can we get this uh, young lady a chair in the back, please? So much, she just walked in, thank you so much. We got a couple of chairs over here, we can move them around and... Yeah, uh, okay, now can we get this? Jun, there's a chair right in the chair. <laughs> that's, that's right. No, 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 we have to still get you a chair, Jerry. Appreciate you coming. And uh, now we got to get this gentleman in the chair. Just put him in the chair. Please, can we, can we fill in. Can you scoot over one, Jerry, so this guy can just pull that chair back there if you don't mind? Yeah, pull that one where you can. How are you doing? Okay, there we go. All right, yes, yeah, community meeting, you know, we, we figured it out. But, um, and so basically, I was just giving an update on, on what that situation was. Um, uh, Tanner's going to put us in touch with the uh, folks at AT&T so we can have a direct conversation um, in terms of their intentions, in terms of the uh, metrics use as far as the toxicity components, um, radiation uh, distribution, you know, the width, things of that sort. And so, uh, Skid Row Council Formation Committee, we're on the case. Uh, Quick update, Firehouse 23, those that don't know, um, there haven't been any current meetings. Uh, 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 so I don't know, we got John Malby, the chair of that, uh, the LV NOP. Is there any uh, meeting set up currently? Surprisingly, since they wanted to have one within two weeks from last meeting, which was in November. <laughs> right. Nothing. Right, so for those that don't know, uh, on 5th and basically Maple, uh, actually, a few few parcels uh, east of the uh, King Edward Hotel. There's an amazing city-owned property called Firehouse 23, also known as the Ghostbusters Firehouse. And <clears throat> excuse me, it was a part of uh, Proposition K, which in the voters in 1996 uh, voted to uh, make that an art center for kids. Um, they haven't done anything in 23 years. <laughs> so the kids that they voted and approved in 1996, they're grown. <laughs> uh, a lot of the kids that are living in Skid Row, they moved out in, in the city of politics, containment zone policy that actually restricted family, low-income family housing in Skid Row. So when they're talking about, you know, art center for kids, what what kids are they talking about? So we've been, we've been fighting against that because what we want to do, in addition to uh, access and art center for kids, we have a lot of 
adult artists in our community that we want access to this very same parcel when the, when the, the kids aren't using it. And so if they're talking about spending currently, it's about you know, 10 to $15 million to completely refurbish the building, get it to you know, ADA compliant and things of that sort. Um, you know, for them to do that, and then the kids will obviously will be school in the morning, and then after school, it's the after school program from three to seven, and so four hours a day is what they're talking about the intended use, and then it'll be closed in the morning and closed in the evenings. And we've got all these uh, adults in uh, the Skid Row community, which uh, with need for space, artistic <laughs> space specifically. And so yeah, we're, we're opposed to that. So uh, uh, John Malpete here is the uh, one of the founders of uh, and directors of uh, Los Angeles Poverty Department. Uh, arts and cultural uh, nonprofit that's been in Skid Row since 1985. And uh, uh, John Malpede is actually the chair of the uh, local volunteer neighborhood organizing committee. Uh, oh, come on, John. Well, I just want to say that at the end of that meeting, the, the committee asked the vote, uh, they asked the city to come back at the next meeting, or to come back at the next meeting with, with something in writing saying that, they, that there would be substantial uh, programming and access to, for the adult uh, community. But that, since then, no meeting has been scheduled. That's right. So the last meeting, as John mentioned, uh, uh, was uh, in Skid Row, and it was, uh, what was it? Uh, the James <coughs> Community Center. And we, we, the community, said we wanted it in writing because the presentation said, according to the Prop K language, that, the, that the, the money in the parcel could only be used for arts programming for children. And so they're telling us like to just to push the project through. Yeah, 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 don't worry about it. We'll add the adult programming later. And we said, no, 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 if you can do that, put it in writing. And so that's what the uh, LV Not Committee said, put it in writing. And again, we haven't heard, that was in November. They said the next meeting would be in anything from actually it's May. <laughs> That's a whole nother month and we still haven't heard anything from it. And so it's a problem for us and so with our, our, our formation committee and the other community uh, uh, representatives, you know, we're, we're here and we're, we're staying on top of that. Um, in November of last year, our formation committee has been busy. This is our first meeting this year. Um, so we're just giving an overall update. In November of last year, we put together a town hall meeting uh, folk and invi uh, inviting uh, the Department of Mental Health there, and our, our featured keynote was um, Dr. Jonathan Sharon, who is the new director of DMH. And so, since because DMH has a three billion dollar annual budget, and with the high concentration of of, and, 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 uh, of uh, homeless folks that you know suffer from mental illness and skid row residents that uh, need these uh, services. You know, it was very uh, important for us to have a direct opportunity, have a direct conversation with the director. So we want to do that with all the city agencies, all the LA County agencies, and let's have a one-on-one -on -one direct connection and give the community an opportunity to speak directly. So they know what's working, what's not working, what needs to be improved, things of that sort. And so um, that was so that town hall meeting was so successful that uh, DMH has now decided to, to, to uh, reduplicate those. Uh, us countywide. So, you know, Skid Row Neighborhood Council Formation Committee, you know, we initiated that. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, uh, recently, uh, not only uh, I was there in City Hall to represent the uh, Skid Row Neighborhood Council Formation Committee, but also LA Can was there strong and based Council File 19 0311, which was a, uh, focused on the illegal fencing out on the sidewalks that is actually displacing homeless folks and preventing them from um, having allowable access on the sidewalks. And so, you know, we call the hashtag Displacegate. <laughs> and so, um, it was through the uh, uh, Planning and Land Use Committee in the City Hall. Um, they pushed it, you know, they forwarded it. It was a unanimous vote. And then when it got before a City Council, it was also um, approved unanimously. And so, now that it's investigation and removal is what the actual uh, language said, and so we will be monitoring that um, to see exactly how. What are the, there's no time frame on that. Uh, again, council file one nine zero three one one. For those of you keeping score at home and want to follow this, um, because it's, it's citywide, and so um, also um, Catherine McNinney of the uh, our formation committee, she did some uh, 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 research and found out, you know, in terms of uh, Sacramento. State of California, you know, there's a requirement that you have to notify 811 
and if you're going to do any type of concrete cuts, you know, planting trees and things of that sort. And there are a lot of these uh, parcels, that these property owners did not do that. And so, um, uh, among other penalties, um, it could be up to a $50,000 fine per parcel. And not only that, because we have proof, video proof, emails uh, through PRAs, we have proof that uh, the city actually uh, worked in, in solidarity in collusion with these property owners through as a part of part of uh, Operation Healthy Streets with the cleanup campaigns and then the extension where they clear the homeless folks off the sidewalks. They do the extensive cleaning and then here come the gates behind it. And so it was it was a, a, a concert a concerted effort. And so the city of Los Angeles also might be uh, subjected to uh, serious uh, penalties and fines. So. We don't know about that. Um, I want to break right now because um, uh, uh, something that has just happened today was uh, the Mitchell case, Mitchell v. City of Los Angeles. Uh, the city signed off on that. And if we can get Pete White to come up here and speak to that a couple of words. I mean, it's not. So the Mitchell case was, in fact, settled. I, um, I'm Pete White, first of all. Welcome to LA County. Welcome to the house. Um, <laughs> the other thing I think is important before I talk about Mitchell is to let you know where the bathrooms are. So if you go out this door to your left, there are bathrooms that people can use and water fountains. And so just really quickly, um, when we think about settlements uh, in the city of Los Angeles, when I think about Mitchell, Carl Mitchell, um, Tony Levan, um, Jones, Edward Jones, these are all just plaintiffs in cases against the city of Los Angeles that fundamentally have to do with the question of do houseless people have Fourth Amendment rights? This is fundamentally what we're talking about. Um, and of course, I would hope um, we would all say yes. Houseless people and everyone in this room have Fourth Amendment rights, right? Rights to property, rights to be free from search and seizure. I just got off the phone a couple of times. Uh, I had about five uh, interviews in the last uh, 20 minutes. And uh, NBC Channel 4, I guess it was, they said, well, isn't this a win? Um, and I reminded them that this is not a win, right? It's only a win when we don't have houseless people who have to rely on the public sidewalks in the city of Los Angeles um, to house themselves and to live. It's only a win when we can reallocate resources um, that are going towards criminalization when addressing a public health and a humanitarian crisis. So Mitchell just continues to be another uh, step forward and hopefully um, reminding the city of Los Angeles that actually folks have rights. The other thing that becomes important about Mitchell, um, when, we, when we look at the headlines, the mayor and others talk about how much we care about houseless Angelinos, right? But at the same time, and that's the rhetoric, rhetorically, but at the same time when we talk about how much care, if we look at the resources that are allocated, there are 10 times more resources allocated towards criminalization than towards housing. And so in the mayor's 2019, 2020 budget, there's $38 million in the budget um, allocated, scheduled for houseless sweeps. So Mitchell becomes important because it creates guidelines by which hopefully this time um, the Department of Sanitation, the police department, and others can follow uh, in terms of protecting, preserving houseless people's properties. Is it a win? It's not a win. It's not a win until we have no more houseless folks in the city of Los Angeles right. across the, the country. It's not a win until we start looking at houselessness as a public health crisis, a uh, humanitarian crisis, and not a criminal crisis. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> and for those of that, that, that maybe it may be your first time coming to a Skid Row community meeting, um, I don't know about other community meetings, but we're we're thorough. We're thorough with how we get that. <laughs> we take pride in that. So uh, you know, P. White's been doing a strong LA Can, LA Catholic worker. We got a lot of amazing organizations that are doing a lot of tremendous work here. You know, we even got Radio Justice in the background, Adam Rice and a whole bunch of you have no idea who I'm glad Jerry Sullivan is back there on town though. Thank you so much. I hope you can stay for some of these presentations. Um, next up we want to talk about uh, actually Jeez. Yeah, we want to talk about one uh, presenter, a uh, recent uh, purchase uh, uh, property in uh, Skid Row on 4th and Crocker, Little Tokyo Service Center, 
Barfield, a Yumiya, uh, Yumiya rice cake uh, uh, factory uh, where they made rice cakes and uh, fortune cookies. Uh, they were invited to present tonight, but they said they couldn't do it. They sent an email and said, basically, we have nothing new to uh, present at this time other than what was talked about in the uh, Rafu Shimpu uh, Japanese newspaper. And for those that don't know the Rafu Shimpu, uh, which is located on the uh, northeast corner of 3rd and Alameda, uh, they are the largest Japanese daily newspaper in the entire United States of America. And so um, we just want to uh, go through their, uh, so basically they intend to, they said they intend to uh, construct between 120 to 150 low income units. And that's something that uh, at a future meeting, we will get back and uh, uh, talk to them and have them present to our community. Because, you know, we want to know is that they said that fifty percent would be for permanent supportive housing, and, and so that, that kind of sounds like it qualifies our scale community. And then, then what about the other fifty percent? And maybe it'll be Little Tokyo and the scale growing and together. But our main concern is that are the folks in Little Tokyo trying to uh, uh, impede into Skid Row and, and, and house their community and, and, and expand their uh, their uh, campus because the uh, the uh, Boundaries of the most southern boundary of Little Tokyo stops at Third Street. So this parcel is actually extends just south of Fourth Street, and so there's a lot of uh, you know communication that needs to be done in terms of what's going on. And so um, in Skid Row, we're very uh, particular for those that don't know the boundaries of Skid Row: Third Street to the north, Seventh Street to the south, Main Street to the west, and Alameda Street to the east. Fifty city box, and we're very uh, concerned about any and everything that goes on within those boundaries, and so because of that, again, we're, we're we'll talk about the uh, the uh, efforts to create the scaling accounts in a moment. Um, just running through this list, whatever we have, um, the scaling neighborhood council. Those that don't know, we gave a letter of support to the uh, Weingart Towers project um, that's moving forward. So that's again, that's another another successful effort from the uh, scaling neighborhood council formation committee. Uh, that will be discussed uh, at a later uh, meeting. What else we have? Uh, we'll wait for Pastor James. He's not here. But right now, um, because Skid Row is technically in the boundaries of the downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council, uh, we they have a we're we're concerned with their board and well as well as what they do for our Skid Row community. <clears throat> and they the, the downtown Sense Neighborhood Council, also known as D-Link, has elections coming up next month. Um, there's a, a slew of uh, candidates. We actually have one candidate who is in attendance tonight. Uh, hopefully we wanted to come up here and uh, say some things because she's representing the uh, social service provider seat, which Skid Row qualifies to vote for her. So a couple of minutes to uh, Bryn Whitfield. Come on up. <laughs> a couple times a week, um, but as he mentioned, I'm running for the social services provider seat, and um, that's because for the past two years, I have volunteered at Skid Row, um, on Skid Row at uh, a School on Wheels, so it provides academic mentoring for kids that are on Skid Row, as well as throughout different shelters and hotels and things throughout um, throughout Los Angeles County. Basically, I can't claim to, to, to know this neighborhood. I haven't lived here, but by day, I'm a public, um, public relations professional. I have a social media marketing and essentially what I see this entire, this situation as it, we have discussed is just rebranding. Um, so I would like to take what I've done with my Fortune 500 companies and my work on the show oil and small prices, hopefully I can be of some use and support here, but just support what you guys are doing and learn and listen and be a voice. So, so if anybody that qualifies to vote this election, tell them where, where they can vote and how to June 20th, Thursday, June 20th, from 2 to 8 p.m. at the block. Um, voting and just make sure that you bring your ID um, as well as some sort of proof that you either own, rent, live, work, or have some sort of affiliation to downtown. Um, the downtown city limits as defined now. So that could be church group or um, any sort of membership or faith based organization or anything like that. So. Are you guys self affirmation or do you require proof? Uh, so, but, uh, the documentation. So, if you're if you are homeless, you don't have to provide documentation, but it is self documentation. So, you do um, for homeless, they can self affirm, but for everyone else, you need 
to bring the, two form, uh, the form of ID as well as the proof of stakeholder. Oh, the question is the block part of the, the delay? Is block part of the, the voting is that the block? Right? Yes, yes. Is the block part of that area? Yes. Where is the block? Seventh and Flower. Seventh and Flower. Thank you. Or said and hope, depending on this is why. <laughs> um, any other questions for Bryn? So I just want to say that um, Bryn, I, you know, Bryn contacted me and she did her due diligence to say, you know, she wants to, you know, come connect with the Skid Row community. Um, we met probably for about four or five hours. I don't know. <laughs> Six hours. And I, yeah, I really want to get, give her our Skid Row perspective. Um, you know, the, you know, it was contrary to what's being said in the mainstream media. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, perspectives in terms of what's really going on in Skid Row. Uh, what does the future of Skid Row look like? What are the true um, estimates? What are the true metrics? All of that. And so the fact that Bren was wanted to come to, you know, reach, you know, to someone with their boots on the ground, who's got a finger on the pulse. And so um, it's very important for uh, me to thoroughly uh, talk your hero, but I was no idiot. Yeah, quickly, idiot, can. Um, I'm sitting back and, and, and I heard the terminology used, rebranding, mm -hmm. and and being someone who has, has been in this community for quite some time, and has been general justice boots on the ground. This community has been potentially rebranded, you know, uh, so many times, right, with no action behind it, right. Material conditions on the ground have not changed. So when you say rebranding, could you define what you mean? So right now the narrative, which is Skid Row, which is across America, so we're known as the homeless capital of the world. How does how how do you feel that that is perceived in the greater Los Angeles County as well as throughout the rest of the country? So when you when you start with from that point, you're guaranteed to not go that far by by its name Skid Row, right? And also it's known as the homeless capital of the world. Like that just from messaging to language to ever, like everything about it needs to change. Like the words that we use have to change. And actually, Jeff taught me amazing, uh, amazing. Like I always describe it as, "Oh, I'm going down there, down there." And he, you know, he's clearly right. Why are we using words like that down there? It's these small things, and that tr starts to change perception. But I've noticed even in the small, the few meetings that I've gone to with local business owners, it's just the the, mm -hmm. the negative connotation that comes along with Skid Row homeless capital of the world. I mean, that's not, we're starting down here, we're just starting where we should, where we deserve to be, in order to have an actual, more effective I'm not going to get into a long conversation. But I don't know uh, these things. I just... See, language is very important. Right. And the narrative that you're speaking is the narrative that others speak. But us on the ground, we know that skate roll goals are very far away, right? Jeff just talked about two victories that we had today, which LA can was very instrumental, Absolutely. right, and bringing about, right? And those are just two victories in a, in a plethora of victories that we've had in Skid Row, okay? Uh, there's infrastructure, health infrastructure, that the city didn't bring to Skid Row, but we brought to Skid Row. This right. So when you, talk, when you talk like that, you lose people like me who know what the, the intellectual capital and property of this community is, right? And through the work that has gone forth and through the victories that we've won and through the, the institutions that we've put in place, we know that this community diametrically opposed or opposite of any other community that's doing some things. Right. It's, not, it's not the truth, right? So I, I want you to but understand. Do you know that? Hold on. No. But listen, listen. We're here making a difference. Right? The rest of the world is going to think what they want to think. Right? So when we talk about rebranding, the rebranding comes by the work, right, that we do, the actions that we put in, and the results that we get. It doesn't come by uh, terminology or anything of that nature. And I think you need to understand, when you use that language, it's very disrespectful to the people who are on the ground. Right? And this is heartfelt, because I work these streets every day. We work these streets every day. We put in work every day, sometimes seven days a week. So we see the potential, right? We know what is in Skid Row, right? And no branding is going to change what's happening here. And it, oh, all right, Jeff. Oh, and, and if I may, um, again, we just had one meeting. 
Um, it's our first meeting. She, you know, basically Bryn just got here. And, um, you know, she, you know, we are working with her. That's why she's here today to say, you know, here I'm making myself available for the community. And obviously there's going to require more dialogue and so that the messaging gets right. The perspective is fully absorbed. And so we get in there. So, you know. Yeah. And I think, to, like, I would love to, I obviously, it would, my, the role would be to advocate. And I, I need to learn and I want to learn. At the same time, I have 13 years of professional experience working with billion dollar global brands and I want to bring that I'm volunteering my time to bring it to what your story is to help make social media marketing public relations media relations media outreach knowing that what has happened what you guys are doing every day that that's known and not right now how it's perceived as people when they're using certain terminology and all the, the things that you just described so it's taking exactly what you said but making that known that's the richness of this community. Um, so just, I just want to be a conduit and help, and you know, my clients that pay me, and I just want to volunteer my time and services because I care. So. Excellent. Let's go to Craig. Yeah, uh, I, I understand the use of the word branding since you're the head of a marketing firm. Uh, but what I'd like to ask you specifically is, should you win this election, well, what do you propose for you to do to help the people in Skid Row, not on Skid Row, in Skid Row, who live their lives here, like myself and Eddie and other people, what what skills, but other than helping with branding and message, do you propose to use to help the people in Skid Row? So D-Link is an advisory committee, so that so it's not writing policy. It's essentially just meeting one on one and in group settings and um, really understanding like what what is going on, what they're voting on, what you guys are aware of. So you see us as a subgroup that needs you as a translator to the <laughs> overall dominant group? Is that the idea? You should, uh, we should talk after because you have a really good <laughs> job in my, in my industry. No, no, there's no, there's no, like my sentiment, my intentions are pure. Um, so, you know, it's, I would love to be able to help um, and just, in order to give you a megaphone, like it's just something that yeah. I do for a living and just making exactly what you feel and what you share. Uh -huh. No, that's So that's your, your, your campaign central idea is altruism? You, mean you just want to help out? The time frame. <laughs> is that it? I wouldn't say altruism. I, I just say that I am wanting to take my professional experience um, and use it for, you know, not something for messaging. Yeah. Major, okay. major brands. Fair enough. You've answered the Excellent. Point. Let me get the Adam. Well, I, I think the confusion comes when, see, I think the thing is you missed what we need. What's wrong with us being Skid Row? Because at Skid Row, we preserved housing downtown. That's how the hotel preservation ordinance is here. 15 years ago, everybody would have been gone if Skid Row didn't come together to do that. You know, Skid Row is an honor to be in. You have some of the most amazing people in the country. I don't think what we need is branding. As an advisory committee, even though you can't write policy, you can suggest policy. You can suggest how things run. I would suggest holding another vote for a Skid Row Neighborhood Council because it doesn't really make much sense, even though you have come and help. And there's no putting that aside. That's a beautiful thing. But you're making it obvious that you do not understand this community right now. So why would we vote for you as opposed to one of our own, as an example? So why, then that's, that's really the question that you might want to be able to answer. So in research <laughs> How the size branding would that apply? That that's that's my question because you you haven't. I'm good. I'm good. 
Thank you, my sister. I'm going to leave you alone, Jeff, because you did, you did not want to do this right here, but that's all right. That's all right. We good. Right on, my sister. Right on. I mean, this is a community meeting. That's what the Formation Committee is about. Bryn is not shying away from anybody, any topic. Um, she's a strong, viable candidate. And based on the structure, again, as I, I, I led into this, I premise this by saying, based on the structure that is in place right now, Skid Row is uh, being represented by the downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council. And so in your category, I believe there are five candidates and there are two seats available. And, you know, some of those other folks have been either misrepresenting Skid Row or totally <coughs> don't have a clue. And so, you know, if, if we, the formation committee, just like with any other land use issues or any other things that are going on in the best interest of Skid Row, we have vetted this candidate and we're saying we like this candidate. And so, of course, that's for dealing. But moving forward, there's clearly a need for um, additional uh, discussions and dialogue because no one can fully grasp our perspective in one six hour meeting. And I'm sure you all will agree with us on that one. And so, again, I invited Bryn here today to, for an initial meeting of the community. And of course, it's going to lead to further dialogues in the, uh, in the future. So I appreciate uh, the questions. If we got Caleb, come on, Caleb. Bryn, thanks for coming down here tonight. Um, I would lead with housing rather than hashtags. Um, we've had a lot of house ta hashtags. What we really need more than hashtags is housing. There's a lot of vacant buildings in this neighborhood. And if you don't have a plan for how to change those into housing, you should talk to me or John. I don't see Steve Diaz here from LA Can. But there's a lot of land use work to be done in this neighborhood because it's gone very crooked for 20 years. Mm. Right. Very crooked. And buildings have sat vacant while people die on the streets mm. that could be used to house people. We're going to talk about some of that tonight, right. I think. Right. But there's a lot more buildings to turn into housing. Right. And if you don't have an idea of which ones to look at or policies that can be put in place, please come at me or John or Henriette, who've been working on this for a long time, the land use work of advocacy which is what's really gonna move the needle over the next couple of years. Because there's policies that can be put in place while we're rezoning, while we're redoing the code, right. that can totally change getting people's basic needs met. Right. And so I wouldn't talk so much about social media as much as what's actually gonna help people, which is house keys, room and a bath, their own kitchen, and getting their basic needs met. House keys, not handcuffs. House mm. keys, not handcuffs. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, are there any other further questions? Are we good? Because we are moving this thing along. We appreciate Brent Whitfield for uh, showing up. Those that are qualified and able to vote on June 20th yes. between 2 and 8 p.m. Uh, show up at The Block. It's on 7th and Flower, um, the downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council uh, meeting, uh, elections, I'm sorry. And uh, we hope that uh, Bren will uh, win. If she doesn't, she will still be a new member of yes. the Sierra Little Council Formation Committee. Yes. So let's give her a hand and uh, we'll talk to her. Are there any other questions at this time? Because we're moving this thing along. You had a question? You good? This, this is just a comment um, because oh. my commute was a little shorter. I was from Boyle Heights to here, just over the bridge. <laughs> but I still enjoy the commute. <laughs> and, um, you know, we've re what, re branding. They, 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 they've been trying to rebrand our name for a long time in Boyle Heights. You know, the artist came, artist gallery came about five, six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And I still remember the, the article from Wall Street Journal. Lady said, I'm bringing arts to the east side. Huh? And, and so when I hear branding and rebranding, I think gentrification, I think push out. It's, right. So it's, it's, it's just trigger words. Yeah. They're, they're trigger words for people like me and a lot of people in this audience. Right. And, and it, that's the first thing I thought. Like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, sure. And, and, that's, and that's good to know. Branding yeah. and, and, that, and brand, I understand how branding is perceived as yeah. maybe like changing the logo or changing the name of the yeah. thing. Branding is an industry thing for changing the conversation yeah. or any of these other jargon words. It's a very broad 40,000 feet in the air kind of like general. It's another word for for public relation, public advocacy, public engagement. It's just about changing the conversation. So, um, and just making just write down stories that rich stories aren't being told. So how, so how do we do that? But I apologize. I'm going to take a note for saying rebranding and that it's a trigger so word. Just, but it's yeah. learning. I'm, I'm now eight hours in. So it's good. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I want to learn more. And I'm, I, you know, very, very egoless, and I just want to learn and share. And hopefully, I can help. Tell me how I can help. Well, to, I just a kind tip, though. In the future, remember when you come into these rooms, we know more about how policy works 
than the people that are in power. <laughs> Fact. So just longer. remember that. Especially in this room. Especially in this room. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what again, that's one of the unique qualities about the Skid Row community is like contrary to popular belief or what the narrative is that's going out through mainstream media, we actually got some 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 very active and very knowledgeable folks in our community on the front lines and we're not playing we have in our business. Great. Um, we're gonna move this thing along. Thank you all for the, the, the live and the rich conversation. But well, we have two uh, feature uh, presentations. Um, you know, very, very excited. Land use. We want to know what's going on, who are these folks coming in to build some stuff in our community. And as you can see how intense and how thorough uh, the, the conversation has been in this meeting thus far, um, these presenters, y'all better put your seatbelts on. <laughs> We're coming for you too. No. Um, <laughs> um, you know, that's just my little icebreaker, but you never know. You know we got some heavy hitters in the building. We don't need, we don't need a community full of hundreds and thousands of people. We need key leaders in the room that, you know, you know, this is the first look. So, you know, I, I didn't open this up to, you know, come one, come all. You know, there's no, oh, you know, here's food, get some food, don't forget about dinner at the mission, we're just piling. You know, we're not doing that here. This is Skid Row Council Formation Committee, and we lead a lot of the conversations, and, and those that know, Brother C.C. coming in, thank you, sir. And so, um, you know, all right, brother, and so um, uh, we are, you know, giving this a first look, the first layer, if you will, in terms of, of the Skid Row community, and this, this layer is very, very critical. Um, you know, we don't want to intimidate the presenters. We really, really want to see what you all have to offer. Um, and you, you, and when you leave this meeting, you're going to get an initial thumbs up or thumbs down. And if you've already purchased the building and you get a thumbs down right now, well, it's going to be a long road for you guys. <laughs> so but the good news is there's room to still room to negotiate to you know you know shred that little proposal or whatever you thought you had, and we can rebuild it and build something that's nice that has you know includes community input and we can build something that we all can appreciate and fall in love with, and that will uh, give it that long-lasting uh, opportunity for uh, um, an elongated uh, existence in our community. So with that, uh, we're gonna flip a coin. Mercy Housing is up first. We've got Erica and Mercy Housing. Oh. Uh, assistance from Pete White. <laughs> no relations to uh, Battle White. No relations. Ah! <laughs> no, we just win here. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> um, I'm going to call up my colleague, Anna like uh, Spear, yeah. to join me too. Uh, so thank you so much, General Jeff, <laughs> and uh, the community here for inviting us to give a very, very brief introduction to Mercy Housing. Like, um, like uh, Lisa, my name is Erica Villablanca, and I am the Director of Real Estate for Mercy Housing California. Get out of my seat. Um, Ami's going to go into a little bit more detail about who we are and what we do. Um, I am a LA transplant, came here with my family when I was four years old, and I grew up on 23rd Street, just between Figueroa and Hoover. Um, went to school in the neighborhood, um, grew up in slum housing. And so when I went to college and discovered that I could do something to house our low-income families and veterans, it was like, wow, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life, and that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years. Um, so the next one. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, sorry. I'm here to. Oh, I'm here. That's bogus. I am here to. Uh, we're here to talk about a proposed development, and we'll go into a little details in a little bit. But Ami will introduce herself and. Tell you a little bit about what Mercy is. Yeah, I want to also just um, point out how important Erica Villanueva is to our organization and Mercy Housing. She's a she's led as a woman of color the real estate department for the last six years, and under her guidance, we've really grown Mercy Housing's profile in Los Angeles. And um, I I am not originally from Los Angeles, but um, I mean my role at Mercy Housing is regional director of um, but I did, I do have roots in Skid Row in and on 6th Street 
in South America, San Francisco. So I was there for over 10 years of my life and ran um, a sidewalk steam cleaning enterprise and ended up meeting with Chrysalis back in the day. Um, and also had a side, uh, mural production business for Youth and Risk, as well as help small businesses in what was called the Sixth Street Corridor, which no longer I recognize. You know, we did a lot of anti-displacement work. We tried to kick out dot-com companies back then, and now it's kind of modified into Twitter headquarters. So a lot of criticism I got then as a young organizer is you created this artificial neighborhood by creating an overlay zone, and as a result, the economy People just built around the tenderloin, and that's your fault for creating a displacement zone. But our response back then was affordable housing, which is what you just described, and workforce and enterprise development, employing youth at risk and our houseless residents at risk. So that's kind of my background. I'm also a member of Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice, and just want to continue to do that kind of work for Mercy Housing, but also as an individual, having dedicated my life to social justice on my life. So, um, Mercy Housing is 38 years old. We were founded by the Sisters of Mercy in Nebraska. We um, have a presence in over 42 states. Our Los Angeles office opened in the 90s, and um, we are mostly um, developing in um, Southern California, and in California as a whole, have about 130 companies. Los Angeles is expanding rapidly, Southern California under, under uh, Erica's leadership, and she's going to tell you today about our development in Six and San Julian that we are not, you know, we don't own it yet. So, but we are proposing to you um, supportive housing uh, with the um, residents of uh, Sixth Street in mind, given that we can probably predict that the latest home is going to be about 12%, right? 53,000, probably even 17%. So that's probably going to come out soon. And we want to make a small dent in that, even if it's just 90 some units. And Eric is going to talk more about that. So I'm not going to go into the other statistics, but it's pretty mostly how uh, I do family housing. But I think right now the focus is on housing, um, you know, supportive, doing supportive housing. And so thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Eric. So those that's just some verbiage on Mercy. You don't have to read just the, what we do. So we do development. We also property manage our own buildings. Um, we do provide services and we also asset manage our buildings. And then uh, Ami went into a little bit. We have about 34,000 current residents in our properties. Um, and we do um, <laughs> use the housing first and not in the harm reduction model to address homelessness. And then you work, the work that I really like Houseless. Houseless. I really like that. Um, so we do a lot of case management, health and wellness, referrals to mental and physical health providers, benefits, advocacy, and community. So what we're proposing, and I'll go and I'll show some slides. Uh, we are proposing about 80% of the units to be for homeless adults with special needs. Um, possibly some general affordable units at around 50% of the AMI. So right now we're looking at 94 total units. And so that would be about 75 for permanent supportive housing and the rest for about 50% AMI. Um, we are gonna include some parking spaces <coughs> and right now financing, we're looking at the 4% low income housing tax credits, a conventional mortgage, uh, the LA County's Affordable Housing Trust Fund, possibly, uh, the City of LA's Prop HHH, and uh, the upcoming No Place Like Home housing from the county, and I'm sorry, not from the county, from the state, and also there's supportive the housing, multi family housing program. And staffing, so we've um, just, in, just as a very rough look at what we're proposing. Uh, we will have an on-site property manager that lives that will live at the site. Uh, we'll have an assistant property manager working. We're going to have 24-hour uh, full-time desk clerks rotating. Uh, one maintenance manager, one maintenance technician, and a full-time janitor. 
Uh, for services, we're thinking of a full-time resident services coordinator uh, that will be supported by case management that will probably be provided through the county's Department of Health Services, assuming that the Measure H funding is available. So this is just a very brief look at the site. Everybody's familiar with it on 6th and San Julian. Um, and the view of the downtown skyline is that way. Six horizontal, San Julian North stop. So the next. Is there, just, excuse me, is there a physical building or is that just raw land? No, there's a building. I think uh, right now it's currently used as a warehouse and it has that like, little oh. restaurant slash store. Is that, is that on a just so folks know, it's the very building where our skin row yes. and mural is on, right there on the corner. So, oh. Right just immediately south of the Union Rescue Mission and immediately right across the street from the Midnight Mission where Mama's store is. So first of all, the mural stays. Okay, Erica, thanks. Thank you. Uh, next Thank you one. That. And um, this is, these are just, so we had a, our architect just take a little, um, what is, oh, just render. Yes, just, just some con very early concept <laughs> of what, they were the division at, the cor at that corner, which is so important. And so this is just very rough, very first. We really um, know that the importance of activating the street is going to be, a, it's a very critical component of this. And so we did start having some very um, early one-on-one -on -one outreach with the community, met with Steve here back in November. So we've been meeting with or small organizations the last six months, and I'm so glad that we finally connected with Jeff and are able to just give you a little overview about Mercy and what we're proposing. And the last slide is just another view of the rendering. So there's really not a lot of details other than what I've shared. We're applying for entitlements um, in about a half and hope to get entitled so that we can continue with the project and come up, come back to the community with more details and get your input. And um, that's all I have for now. Is there any anticipation on when you know, uh, the process will uh, be completed? In, uh, so in you, um, we're planning to, uh, to submit our autonomous application in about six weeks. We're hoping to get approvals probably by November, December of this year. If the city moves fast <laughs> on as part of the general, um, not the general plan. Sorry, the greater the greater downtown. Uh, yes, the that one, that ordinance. Um, and so, if we get that and we get our financing as we want, we probably would be looking at starting construction next summer. Mm -hmm. uh, my my key question. What's the status of my mirror? No. <laughs> We're gonna have more oh, oh, you gonna tear my you don't tear my mirror down. It's it's <laughs> worth <laughs> trying to be Is uh the the, the the units out here, the SRO there, sealed oh. weather units mm -hmm. and you Great know, is this out? So they're all be one bedrooms with their own kitchens and their own bathrooms. Is it one bedrooms or are they singles? No, one bedroom. So you have your actual bedroom, oh, then you have your living room, your kitchen, okay. oh. your bathroom, and then the property <laughs> manager's <laughs> unit will be two bedrooms. Okay. Unit size? Um, I'll have to get back to you, but they're probably around, because they're one bedrooms, they're probably around five to six hundred square feet, but I can, I can bring that back. <laughs> We are under site control, but we have not purchased the building. We have a long term uh, purchase and sale option with the owner. Okay. Caleb? Who's going to qualify? Um, so, it, because we at least 80% of the units will be for formerly homeless, uh, we'll have to go through the county's coordinated entry system. So, at least those 75 units will have to go through that. And the other, the balance, which is 20, if I can do my math right, or 19, would um, just go under the normal AMIs for low, regular low income housing. You guys are TC. TC. Thank you. I appreciate you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh. Can you speak a little bit, please, brother? Oh, uh, yeah, right. 
I want to know you got jobs coming next summer, right? So it's how you gonna jobs. how you how do you um, you gonna have general contractors? Is it gonna be union or what? Um, because we'll be getting funding from City of LA, uh -huh. there are certain percentage that has to be through the <clears throat> the labor unions, mm -hmm. I think. And but is there still a city ordinance since uh, 1992 uh, by the LA Revolt that they have to hire 60 percent of the community? Are you in favor of that or or not? Oh, I'm sorry. Sixty percent of the community yeah, must be uh, locally hired. Local hire. so do you do you, yes. do you are you in favor of that and yes. pushing that? Because we have a lot of uh, other places. You know, you have everybody has a right to housing. Yeah, everybody has a right to to a job. Yes, you know, we've been fighting for that since slavery. Yes. So I'm just saying. Well, I mean, you know, we always had a job during slavery. We don't tell being employed. But the point is, you know. Uh, <laughs> we don't want to get paid. So, I mean, so, uh, and not late. Yeah, yeah, paying job. We always had, we always had a brother. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sixty-five. We was all unemployed. When we go through our contractor selection process, uh, their their uh, experience and their their um, experience with local yeah. hiring is one of the. Oh, okay. That we look yeah, at. I was in the middle. Of, uh, Okay, now, <laughs> so, cause you like, like a lot of these jobs come up, right? They be saying, yeah, we're going to hire the hood, we're going to hire the hood. And they don't. And they always find a reason. No, and it's all. Their contract, so they have to go look You know, we got to go past all that BS, right? You know, I'm just saying. We got a lot of people here. We got women that do construction work. That's what We got men to do. You know, everybody, you know, you got women carpenters. You got, I'm carpenter. I'm just saying. You know, it ain't necessarily me, you understand me? I ain't trying to do all that hard work no more, really, though. I'm a supervisor. I'm a supervisor. But look, keep game. Keep game. We got to put these people to work. Because you got all kind of talent down here. You have electricians. Yes. Some brain yes, surgeons, but now they don't. Know, yeah, but we, we got all kind of talent. Right, 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 right. We got all kind of talent down here. And if we can put in the work at the right general, we must yes. have a right to a job. Part of the people. Oh, uh, part of the people. You know, because they stole all the money from HHA. So it ain't going to be no house. The only way you're going to get housing is help ourselves. So you help us help ourselves. Hire. 88. Thank you, brother. Yeah, I, I, I want to preface my comments by, by first saying this. Um, I'm first and foremost behooving to the people of Skid Row. I love the people of Skid Row, and I give my life to the people of Skid Row. We at LA Can, doing the bomb measure HSH, we made 100,000 phone calls, tapped on 10,000 doors, right? So we were invested in HHH passing. And we've done that in other measures as well. I just want to put that out there for people who are in this room that might not know the kind of work that we've done and continue to do in this room, yes. right? Now, getting back to HHH, I, I, I see that some of your funding is going to be coming from HHH. And my first question is, how much of that fund did you, did you expect to come from HHH funds? About 15 million, 15 to 16 million. Okay. Um, secondly, secondly, I don't know if you are aware, but most of the funding, most of the monies that were in the $1.2 billion have already been spent. They've already been allocated. Right, and uh, I think there's 100 million, 20 million outstanding for a pilot program uh, that the mayor wants to roll out. That's another thing. So even even saying that that you're depending on H H money, that is not a given, correct? Uh, we applied and we already received it. Okay, so uh, right on. It's a given. <laughs> okay, that's great. That's great. That's great. All right. Um. Just quickly, we have a couple of hands in the rotation. I'll get you yeah. on. Um, what is the uh, proposed budget on the entire project? Uh, I'm going to get back to you. I think it's, around, <coughs> so sorry, maybe around 40 million, 30 million, about 40 million. But don't quote me on that. Um, I didn't take a look at my this, list performance. That includes uh, uh, land acquisition as well? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Laura. Uh, no, I just wanted to maybe uh, see when you're taking in applications for ten new tenants that a priority be given to Skidder residents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was my the that was number one. Uh, we we will look at that, but unfortunately, because of fair housing, I don't think we're allowed to do that. But we we can definitely, if you know the ways, 
But, well, I think know. looking at some of the way the artists have done, how some of the other communities have done it for artists that have been pushed out of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, it, that's certainly a way. And look, it's your guys' building, and it's at a certain point you guys get to have a say in who, you know, even just giving them a priority attention, mm -hmm. I think would be tremendous. Uh, it's going to make it more successful. Yeah, no, definitely. Because people who already have roots in this neighborhood are going to build a community there. Do that exactly. <laughs> Pastor James. My question is a little bit about Mercy House. Yes. And it's connected. So are you the actual developer? Are you? Yes, so we're the developers. We are the property managers and we're the resident services providers. But for this one, we will be... Um, Connecting with the people concerned, and they'll be our primary service provider. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm the, my other question. I'm asking because my other question is, in order to, to in order to submit the application for the funds that you want, typically there's a couple there's some criteria that have to be. Mm -hmm. You know, one is um, usually a nonprofit in partnership with yes. a nonprofit. Yes, we're so, a nonprofit. So you're the nonprofit mm -hmm. in the area. Yes. So I so. That's what I'm kind of confused by. We, thought, although we were funded by the sisters, that was a long time ago. So we're not a we're not affiliated with them as a religious organization anymore. We're a, a, non, a federal nonprofit. And I only bring that up because it would make because I I, I understand that there's a partnership and you want to help the people to get wrong. But to me, what would make a lot more sense is that you know, and I'm just throwing this out for example. For example, you know, LA can. Could be your institutional nonprofit partner that you, when you apply for your grant, so in that way, or LA can do development housing under your development. You know, so I think that that is what I'm kind of hearing people saying, you know, uh, and so that's probably not something you can do for this particular project, but I think moving forward, that would be a really, really good, a really, really good idea uh, to bring. So, yeah, so that they can get the technical expertise and learn how to do that. Definitely, we're open to teaching you. No, not just partnering. Yeah, being a part. I'm talking about the money. Caleb, you have to be careful. She asked exactly my question about housing people in Skid Row in Skid Row. If you haven't met a lawyer yet who's come up with a way to, because it's discriminatory to house people from other neighborhoods in this neighborhood when this neighborhood has 10,000 homeless people on the streets every night. It's a misreading of the non-discriminatory clause. So I'm going to find you a lawyer. Let's ask Greg. Uh, <laughs> you look at contingent on support, though, too. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, McNitty. Um, so I'm not speaking for anyone except for myself. Uh, I would love to see uh, more than one person be able to live in new units. There are, like it's been mentioned before, there are zero low income family units in Skid Row right now. There are market rate units in Skid Row, for example, the building I live in, where there's tons of families that live there. It's totally distorted. It's not as if there aren't couples and families and kids that live in Skid Row, there are. And if all this new housing for low-income people doesn't allow for family units, whatever that might look like, <coughs> to live together, that's going to continue to be incredibly distorted, and I'm very concerned by that. And I noticed you, you said in the other slide, it said you do 70% family housing. The units you're talking about, those are pretty big units. Mm -hmm. Two people and a kid who live in that unit. Why? Have you chosen to have only single people be for these units? Uh, this is still very conceptual, so I t t definitely mislabeled that. It should be homeless adults and their families, <laughs> because the the maximum occupancy for those that will be receiving the permanent, uh, the sorry, the supportive services, I think it's going to be three or four, depending on HACLA's maximum occupancy restrictions. And uh, so there could be up to three or four people. Right. Next time I'll bring, I'll make sure to bring in those. Yes. 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 Yes.
I saw another hand up. Freedom. Thank you so much for your heart and your presence and your presentation. Is it possible that managerial staff and other other staff can be can come from the community? Yes, definitely. We always try to recruit from where we work at in the different communities. So the jobs are usually posted probably three to four months before construction ends. So we'll make we we'll usually try to make the best effort that we can to publicize the job. Then we would come back here and let everybody know. So we usually try to do that when asked. I just think the other thing, just, just in terms of a point of clarity, so LA Can, a number of years ago, passed uh, a, a Wiggins policy, and it's a local hiring policy, which gives local residents, it's like a 10-day advance window um, for jobs that come into the community. So we should definitely, so even more than it being something that you want to do, just being really clear that in this uh, redevelopment area, it's something that folks coming in need to do. And then I think the, the last question, is there any business types of opportunities that you guys are thinking about on the ground level or not? Yes, we have about 2,000 square feet that's available. Initially, we were thinking of an art space because that's something that we heard through our, the outreach that we've done, but it's open. <laughs> and that'll be part of our community engagement process to try to find an occupant, um, somebody that wants to do something with when we met with the with the missions, a lot of them were saying that they needed more. Um, we <coughs> the area needs more um, classrooms. Some folks are saying we need more office spaces for some of the the folks that come and provide services. So we've heard a lot of different things. So we definitely want to bring it back to the community and, and see who's <coughs> out there that can be able to provide and and rent that space out and and definitely be a community centered use. The uh, current. First floor business is a mom and pop uh, uh, food uh, vendor. Uh, what will happen to them? They unfortunately will be displaced, but they will be getting some monetary compensation as part of that. Don't quote me on that one. <laughs> but, but yeah, definitely, we know that we don't want to, you know, displace folks that have been here for. Why can't yes, they I just stay? wanted to add that I'll be working with Erica on the ground floor, I guess because of the economic commercial development that I did um, in San Francisco, but also in LA. We do have a, a commercial, um, a very small though. We do mixtures, but not large mixtures in LA. And um, just speaking to the jobs uh, question, um, with project labor agreements and construction, I think there are some hands that are tied there, but I think with what you described, Keith, Internally, we are very committed to hiring people with different experiences, especially in property management and resident services. That's so important to affect, especially linguistically to um, the neighborhood. Um, and when we start our process of ground floor commercial use, I know Pastor Q was, re was referenced to me by Clue because of the church without walls, other uses that can be done. I know we did this on 6th Street in San Francisco when we did ground floor use. We wanted to make sure we got everyone's input before we jumped in there, because what's most important was in case what the neighborhood needs and who the neighborhood can hire. I mean, yeah, who can be hired in the underground person. What is Mercy Housing's in-house policy in terms of this uh, specific parcel in regards to the, 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 the first floor uh, commercial space? Is it the uh, Mercy's desire to have <coughs> um, a business, re a revenue generating business? or just active community space? What does Mercy Housing do? I would say active community space. Sometimes we do lease to businesses that, are, that generate money, but a lot of times we also don't. I mean, have, in San Francisco, where most of our mixed use, we have a public library, we've got small restaurants, we've got a yoga studio. We have a lot of different community serving uh, uh, businesses or small mom and pop. So it just depends on what is viable and what can be done. So yeah, we don't expect something that's going to be making money and be charged away from it. As far as your, uh, um, the renderings, is there a uh, city requirement on how many uh, trees that need to be planted? I'm sure there is. I don't know, off the top of my head. We're sure of it too, but we try to, have a loaded question. Okay, because I want to say that McNinney, part of our member of our formation committee, we have, uh, she has a non-profit, 
right here in Skid Row that is specifically plants trees and maintains trees in in Skid Row in our community. And so hopefully, hopefully uh, you all can connect because if, if there's a requirement for uh, the planting and maintenance of trees that you all can work with uh, Industrial District Green based right here in Skid Row. Excellent. ADH. Yeah, I want to make this quick. I want to get back to the, the job component. <clears throat> I also worked with a coalition uh, that worked with Goodwill, uh, L.A. Rice out of the, the, uh, the mayor's office, and also Lisa Aduna, who was the homeless policy director at the time, to bring jobs to Skid Row. That was one of the things that uh, I'm very adamant about and very passionate about. And we were successful through Goodwill to bring jobs to Skid Row. Um, now we have a works, uh, works work uh, that is open Mondays and, and Wednesdays. Um, Right down the street, 800 to East 6th Street, uh, is housed in the building of United Coalition East Prevention Project. I also work with them on this. My question to you will be this. In terms of hiring from the community, we have the mechanism already in place. The structure is always in, already in place. Through Would you guys be willing to work with those individuals 